Overnight, Saddam's offensive shatters the relations between the United States and their former ally. The leader, who George Bush had been assiduously courting, was transformed into the most vicious of tyrants. We're dealing with Hitler revisited, a totalitarianism and a brutality that is naked and unprecedented. But, once again, there are those who accuse the United States of also being responsible for Saddam's attack on Kuwait. For when President Bush was warned early on that Saddam's troops were beginning to mobilize, he didn't react. He wanted to believe that Saddam was just bluffing. Some claim he was still making every effort to conciliate the Iraqi dictator, for he saw Iraq as an enormous potential market. There was a real euphoria about Iraq as the, the next powerhouse in the region uh, and uh, a place with unlimited amounts of money uh, that could become uh, an important American partner. And customer. And customer. So, President Bush didn't send any stiff warning to Saddam. In fact, American diplomats made it seem as if the United States would not even react militarily. Eight days before the invasion, Saddam asked to meet with American Ambassador April Glaspie. She assured him that the United States would take no position in the event of any border conflict between Iraq and Kuwait. She left, announcing she was going on vacation. Saddam Hussein feels completely reassured. There you have an ambassadress who leaves for vacation the 26th or the 27th of July while he had fixed the date for the invasion, August 1st. And particularly that declaration, we won't get mixed up in anything. Two days later, what Glaspie said was repeated in public hearings by a much higher U.S. official, Tom Kelly, Assistant Secretary of State. Congressman Lee Hamilton repeatedly asked Kelly how the United States would respond if Saddam attacked Kuwait. I recall asking him about treaty commitments and uh, the secretary said there were no treaty commitments involved here. So if you were Saddam Hussein listening to that, what would your... We did not draw, it seems to me, a firm uh, line in the sand. We did not convey strongly and clearly uh, that we would react militarily if he went across that border. A few days later, Saddam invaded Kuwait. Later, when the United States was mobilizing hundreds of thousands of soldiers, another American congressman, Tom Lantos, delivered an even more devastating rebuke to Tom Kelly and the U.S. government for having so long refused to recognize the true nature of Saddam. This obsequious treatment of him by a large variety of high-ranking officials encouraged him to take this action. And there is no way of escaping that responsibility. As the U.S. and its coalition allies prepared to do battle against Saddam, they confronted another awful irony. In many ways, they were taking on an enemy they and their arms dealers had done so much to create. And that brought some peculiar problems. For years, for instance, as part of the deal to sell Mirage fighter planes to Saddam, France also agreed to train Saddam's pilots in France. When the war broke out with Iraq over Kuwait, I realized that there were still pilots who were being trained in France on the planes that we had sold them. Which meant that suddenly we found ourselves in a state of war with Iraq and we had Iraqi pilots in France. But even more embarrassing for the French, their crack French fighter pilots were unable to show off their sophisticated mirage in the fight against Saddam. Why? because they were exactly the same planes they'd sold to the Iraqis. Uh, although the French uh, were f fairly precluded from participating uh, in a lot of the offensive air campaign, we were very concerned that our pilots would not be able to distinguish between a French-operated Mirage and an Iraqi-operated Mirage, so we were worried about fratricide. An even bigger quandary for the U.S. and its allies was the extremely effective defense radar system that the French firm Thompson had sold to Saddam for hundreds of millions of dollars. It incorporated all the newest technologies. The French were able to build a system that integrated all of this into a coordinated air defense system that was quite sophisticated. 
I mean, it was a very, very uh, difficult system to attack. So uh, what was done? Well, uh, because the French were part of the coalition, they were able to provide us a lot of information on the system where the critical nodes were, and we were able to attack it quite successfully. So the, the French in the end gave... The French the in the end took down their own system, basically. Of course, the amount of aid the Americans had given Saddam over the years would also present some curious problems, some that continue to this day. For instance, we found that some of Saddam's elite forces were brought to the United States in the 80s to be given specialized training by the famed American Green Berets. We were training through the Green Berets. We were training counterinsurgency training because we were afraid that uh, if Iran overwhelmed Saddam's army, that the units might have to go underground and operate underground. And so they received training in being able to operate as guerrillas themselves on their home turf. You can imagine now, as we look back on that effort to train them, the consequences were our own troops now facing the Iraqis who got that training from the United States. In 1991, with the U.S. and its allies now out to destroy the military machine they'd done so much to create, the Gulf War became a showcase of the most sophisticated Western technology, a huge, bloody video game. Saddam's forces are driven out of Kuwait, but Saddam's defeat only sets the stage for an even more ghastly tragedy.